So here's one from uh, Dr. Frame, Systematic Theology, page 377. Now, again, uh, we're, we're talking about this idea that, that, that Frame has posited in no uncertain terms that God has two existences. So here's a quote. But the historical process does change, and as an agent in history, God himself changes. On Monday, he wants something to happen, and on Tuesday, something else. He is grieved one day, pleased the next. In my view, anthropomorphic is too weak a description of these narratives. In these accounts, God is not merely like an agent in time. He really is in time, changing as others change. And we should not say that his atemporal changeless existence is more real than his changing existence in time, as the term anthropomorphic suggests. Both are real. Now let me flip over to the quote that you include, James, on pages 92 and 93 of your book. This is from Dr. Frame's book, Doctrine of God, pages 558 through 59. A covenantally present God, like a temporalist God, can know and assert temporally indexed expressions, like the sun is rising now. He can feel with human beings the flow of time from one moment to the next. He can react to events in a significant sense. And you elide a few uh, phrases here, but he continues. He can mourn one moment and rejoice the next. He can hear and respond to prayer in time. Since God dwells in time, therefore, there is give and take between him and human beings. Again, an elision. He continues, so God is temporal after all, but not merely temporal. He really exists in time. But he also transcends time in such a way as to exist outside it. He is both inside and outside the temporal box, a box that can neither confine him nor keep him out. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. They're all written in the page if people want to read it and uh, see what you have to say. But James, how, what, what's really, I mean, this is a continuation of what we've already been talking about, but this, these two existences here are a manner in which Dr. Frame seems to try to overcome this notion of transcendence, this, this problem that God is in and of himself. Yeah, and he's, he, he at least is very clear there that this is not anthropomorphic language. This is not accommodated revelation. This is really uh, a different, existence and a different manner of being for God that is real. And even as he says very clearly, as real as confession to one, unchangeable and timeless, so also is this changing his mind one day to the next and feeling the passage of time and all of this kind of temporal, passable, mutable theism um, he says that that is as equally real for God as God being immutable and infinite in being and all the things that two one says he well, is. Real here should be said is a highly technical word, but we use that in modern parlance all the time. But when we're speaking of real in the doctrine of God, we're not using that as an antonym to fake. It's not a synonym for genuine or legitimate. We're talking about existences, correct? Being. Being. Yeah, and I think that's what he's saying, that there's divine being that is temporal and mutable. That's what he means by real. Um, and I think it, it, it raises the question of where exactly you locate this real, mutable, and temporal, and passable being, which, by the way, our confession doesn't acknowledge that ever. It, in fact, only explicitly stipulates the opposite of that. But if you're going to say all of that is real and it's as real for God as the other, what are you going to do with it? You're going to need some kind of um, some kind of mechanism to explain. Now, in the case of someone like Bruce Ware, the mechanism is the difference between essence and then the non-essential other stuff that's in the being of God, what I call accidents. That's not how that's not the mechanism that frame chooses he chooses i mean that mechanism denies simplicity that mechanism implies the denial of simplicity clearly in frame's case the mechanism that he proposes is in fact far more exotic and uh, i think potentially dangerous which is in fact he proposes for god another existence now this other existence doesn't um replace, you know, I, I like to call it existence A, timeless, immutable, impassable, not composed of parts, infinite in being, and then divine existence B is mutable, 
passable, temporal, etc. And Frame is saying divine existence A and divine existence B are not the same existence, and they're clearly not the same existence. Look at the manner of them. Okay. Um, and I think that he says um, with regard to um, immutability and all, he says God is unchangeable in his all temporal and supratemporal existence. But you have to remember that that's not the only divine existence in Frame's theology. There's a second divine existence. Now, I, I didn't, I did not get into this in the book, but it's worth bringing up since we were looking at the Frame text and Frame's own mechanism, which is double divine existence, both of which are like exactly the opposite of each other. The one is infinite being, the other one is finite being, the one is unchangeable being, the other one's changeable being, one is timeless being, one's temporal, one's impassable, one's passable. The question, the question I have, and he doesn't answer this or, or really seem alert to the concern, is the question of how you could have multiple acts of existence and yet not have multiple beings. And I, I, and, and I mean, that's the concern. Like with regard to well, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we don't say that they have three acts of existence. Oh, no. I mean, and that's uh, we, essence and existence and are the even same with regard, here. Even with regard to my accidental state of being seated, the existence by which my state of being seated exists is actually the existence of my substance in which the accident inheres. So that my, my, my being seated and my being this human, which aren't the same thing, one is a statement about substance, one's a statement about accident, but they are not, in fact, two distinct existences. The existence of my being seated sort of parasitically is borrowed from my substance. When Frame proposes, the only, but I can say, like I'm looking at the two of you out there on, on screen, and I can talk about the existence of Lane and the existence of Camden and the existence of James, and I can talk about three acts of existence. Lane, you're a little older than the two of us. You got here before <laughs> us. Your act of existence preceded our act of existence, and I can tell you that your act of existence is not my act of existence, and I know that because you were here and I wasn't once upon a time. Yeah, maybe okay. we have more potency too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. He's, he's probably actualized more of it. But that I would say, I would say, with regard to multiple existences, when we talk about multiple existences, multiple existences always sync up with multiple existence or multiple beings. When frame, when frame invokes the multiple existences mechanism to accommodate this, what I call both and theism, mutable and immutable, timeless and temporal, he, he invokes a mechanism that sets the table strangely for polytheism. Yes. Let me say this emphatically and immediately. <clears throat> I do not think that Frame even remotely intends polytheism. I don't think that he's a polytheist. I think that his both and theism, the need for a mechanism to explain where he puts, you know, divine existence A and where he puts divine existence B or where he puts immutability and timelessness and where he puts mutability and temporalness. And he proposes multiple existences as a sort of mechanism for handling that. Um, I think he created the problem and the solution that he offers to solve the problem he created is in fact um, light years beyond um, the difficulty of saying um, accommodated revelation or anthropomorphism, right? Whatever, right. whatever difficulty that might have seemed to us, um, I think that Scripture can actually um, accommodate a doctrine of revelational accommodation, whereas I don't think that Scripture can accommodate a multitude of divine existences. So I'll give you one text as an example: um, Psalm eighteen. If you know this uh, text, I just kind of I like to think of this as a doctrine of divine showing uh, Psalm 18. Sorry, I'm turning there. So I make sure that I read it uh, correctly. But it's it's where um, it's where it, verse 25. It says, 
with the kind, you show yourself kind. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. And it says, and with the crooked, you show yourself literally twisted. And, the, and that, this whole, that this whole plurality of showing himself kind or showing himself um, wrathful, for instance, this is in the theater of divine revelation where God can sovereignly author a change in the showing of himself without authoring a change in himself or his existence or without multiplying his own divine existence. And I'm, all I'm saying is on the, on the straight textual level, this idea of accommodated revelation in which you have a variety of divine showings and divine showings that are relative to people as they live in time and space, his face shining upon you as the Levitical priest would have prayed, or as Amos 9, 4 says, his eyes set against you for evil and not for good, that this, this whole idea of divine countenance, of God showing himself, there you can locate mutability, you can locate temporality, you can locate reaction and response, you can locate it all within the theater of divine revelation or divine showing. Let's call that creation, grace, and providence. Um, and what I'm saying is I think that scripture itself already gives us a, fr a, a framework and it doesn't, it doesn't come anywhere near the universe of multiple divine existences. Um, but I think, again, that, that is a problem that frames both antheism has created and the solution, I think, is, um, in fact, I, I, I don't even know what to think of it. It seems... It seems right. so far away from anything. Two existences. Like what are yeah? Two existences, like what our confession yeah. or what herself is talking about. 